Well, hello, welcome everyone to our webinar today. Uh, we are really lucky uh, because uh, we're gonna talk uh, about podcasting and especially new news podcasting during this uh, crisis. Uh, as you know, uh, I am uh, Eduardo Suarez. I am the head of comms at the Reuters Institute and I will be joined uh, by Nick Newman, uh, who is the lead author uh, of our report on news podcasting that I really, really recommend. Uh, first, I mean, some of you uh, are veterans here, but uh, just in case there's someone new, here are the rules of the webinar. First, uh, I, I will make this introduction, then Nick will show his presentation and uh, a few slides on the topic. Uh, we will mute every microphone and uh, hide every camera so, so everyone can follow the speaker. And you are super welcome to send any questions uh, through the chat function uh, here at Zoom that you will find at the bottom of your screen. Um, I will pass as many questions to Nick uh, as possible and we are aiming to finish uh, in an hour or so. Uh, so without uh, further ado, Nick, um, the floor is yours, thanks. Thank you, Eduardo, <coughs> and <coughs> hello, everybody. Uh, so let me just share my slides. Um, yeah, so to project there. Um, can you see those, Eduardo? Yeah. Yes. OK, perfectly. So um, I'm going to talk today about um, why audio and podcast has become such a hot topic uh, and some of the drivers, but I'll also relate it to what's going on right now in terms of the impact of uh, COVID-19. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about the um, underlying drivers for growth. Uh, first of all, I won't spend too much time on that because I really want to focus on uh, news podcasting um, and the opportunities within news podcasting. And that really was the focus of some research we did last December. Um, and then we supplemented um, categorization and really looking at some of the supply issues by talking to publishers in uh, a, a few countries. So four countries, uh, some of the publishers who are really leading a lot of the trends in audio, digging into their strategies around uh, content, but also monetization. So I'll talk about that. Uh, and then I'll come on to what's been happening recently, so in the last few months, in terms of the impact on audio and podcasting uh, with COVID-19. I've been going back to some of the people we talked about, talked to uh, in December, and asking them what has happened in terms of uh, frequency, content, length, what they're trying to do, and what they're seeing in the audience trends as well. And then I'll just finish with a little bit... Um, uh, so my personal thoughts on what the impact of COVID-19 is likely to be uh, on audio and we'll have uh, plenty of time for Q&A. So I'll talk for about 35, 40 minutes and then uh, we can have a sort of conversation after that. So I'm not going to focus too much on the audience side. So we've published at the Reuters Institute a lot of stuff about um, audiences. Other people have published a lot of stuff about audiences. Um, but here's just a little bit of the evidence. Our, our own survey shows significant growth. You've got um, Edison research in the US, which has documented a doubling of consumption over the last four years, something like 90 million people now listening to a podcast monthly. Uh, here in the UK, we have a radio survey, uh, which is the sort of standard uh, for uh, radio and audio showing listenership increases for podcasts of 40% in the last year alone. And some of the other countries um, we've been looking at show similar uh, percentages of growth. Um, but it's not just the growth, it's also the demographics, and that's what's really exciting publishers. And you can see in the chart on the right there that young people, so under 35s in particular, are much more interested in, in podcasting than older groups. So under 40, uh, 18 to 24s, so they're sort of four times more likely uh, to listen to podcasts than people who are over 55. And Last year, we did a little bit of qualitative research around, around this uh, and some of the drivers to understand what's going on. And this slide really sort of sums up uh, some of the key reasons about why podcasts are working with younger people. So I think the first one, this is not just about younger people, this is about everyone. It's just a really, really easy format. It's really accessible. Uh, you don't have to do everything, anything. A lot of people are talking about um, you know, trying to get away from their screens, uh, particularly at, at the moment, and you just need to let it um, happen and it kind of washes all over you, as this quote says. I think the second reason is 
the on-demand nature of it. Um, you know, you're not being told by a radio scheduler what you have to listen to, when you have to listen to it, you schedule it yourself. And obviously digital natives, that's the way they think about things generally. And then the third reason I think is really interesting. So it's about sort of diversity of voices. And it's one of the things that makes podcasting different from radio. Um, and uh, it's, it's young people see radio quite often as stuffy. It's not for them. Podcasts have this sort of younger uh, feel. They're finding diverse voices. They're listening to people like them. And the whole thing feels much more relevant. So I think in a nutshell, this sort of slide sums up what's really different uh, and what's happening combined with, of course, you know, um, the technology. So headphones and headphone platforms, I think, is also really, really key. So headphones getting better, uh, noise cancelling headphones, uh, smart speakers, all this kind of thing. So it's the technology. It's the ease and availability. It's the lack of friction. Uh, and it's the creative of the content, and all of these things are creating this sort of virtual cycle of growth effectively. So um, a huge amount um, about uh, the audience and technology. There's been a lot less work and research done on the supply side. And as I say, that's the main focus of the work that we did in December, I should say. Uh, I did this uh, with a colleague called Nathan Gallo, who did a lot of fantastic work on what's being produced in four countries we looked at, uh, so UK, US, France, and Sweden. And um, we really dug down into what's being produced and especially in news. So firstly, we're gonna look at the sort of overall uh, podcast universe. And I should say this is a, this is a real breakthrough week because both uh, Apple and Spotify have announced that um, we now have over a million different podcasts, different shows in the Apple directory. Um, and uh, Spotify also announced that th this week as well. So both Apple and Spotify have over a million. And you can see the sort of exponential growth in terms of the supply. This is any podcast um, where you sort of move from relatively small numbers growing each year to now 200,000 new podcasts a year. Uh, uh, and we were looking at the end of 2019. Uh, you could also see some of the tipping points, so um, how uh, true crime podcast Serial was a real trigger, a global hit that I think gave people a lot more confidence about the medium and that how it could be different from radio. Uh, you also see the launch of the Daily in 2017 as a, a real another tipping point, and again, uh, that really big growth between 2017 and 2018. So that's kind of all podcasts, and this data came to us from Chartable, who do um, data analytics. Uh, but what proportion of these are news <coughs> is obviously the, the sort of key factor. And in the research we did um, with Chartable, we found that just 6% were what were in the category then uh, news. So that's about 50,000 or 60,000 or so of those, of those 70,000, those million podcasts. But if we then look at the episodes, so the individual charts, which is more based on consumption, uh, we can see that news uh, really punches above its weight. So 21% of all of the, the episodes, this is in the US, and it was similar amounts in, in the UK and Sweden where we looked at it. So news is really, as I say, punching above its weight, a relatively small number of shows being listened to proportionately much more. And then uh, in some countries, you have these sort of aggregated charts. Uh, so there's publisher data in the US uh, from a company called PodTrack. And if you look at their charts, their monthly charts or weekly charts, you can see that uh, the daily there, uh, news now. So basically, news shows are in the top three positions. And uh, right now, <coughs> news shows are... The majority now this is a publisher chart so it's an opt-in so there's going to be more of a focus on, on, on publishers but even so it gives you another indication of how important news is so now let's look at the different types of news podcasts and a reminder this is based on uh, some analysis we did where we categorized effectively the top 200 shows in five countries <clears throat> and uh, and I think it's you know important to kind of break this down into different kinds of opportunities, and that was the idea behind it. And we, uh, you know, you can categorize them in lots of different ways. Uh, we we essentially took a sort of let's take a high level five uh, type approach. And so the first type is um, daily news. So this is a mixture of native shows uh, like Post Reports or or the Daily. <clears throat> 
and then catch up from various radio broadcasters, uh, which may, in many cases, they're taken from their existing output and then put out as podcasts. In some cases, they're kind of hybrid shows. We then have uh, uh, talk and interview based shows. So this is um, things like Political Gab First from Slate was actually one of the first of these kind of shows. Uh, they're much cheaper to make. Thirdly, you've got sort of, I guess you could call them, uh, we call them narrative series, episodic. They're single topics, uh, a little bit like a Netflix series. So you have uh, examples would be Teacher's Pet in Australia, um, or Serial, of course, would be another one. Documentary Strand, so this is where you have um, a sort of a title and then each week there's a different kind of documentary uh, and they continue over time, so a range of different subjects. Um, in, we were looking at Sweden and one of the most popular podcasts of all there is something called P3, which is essentially a documentary strand. And then things like long reads, so some publishers are doing essentially reading out their articles uh, the Guardian is one of those, but a, a few other publishers are doing that and finding some success. So if we look at the numbers on that, again, going back to our categorization, we're splitting this by country. You can see that the biggest category, <clears throat> the highest spikes there, are these interview talk shows. As I say, they're pretty cheap to produce. There's a pretty large number of them. Uh, second biggest uh, peak is these sort of episodic series. Uh, so they're particularly popular in the US and also Australia there. Uh, where true crime is is a very big thing. So 51% of all of the podca top podcasts that we categorized in Australia were of these episodic nature. Um, and then uh, documentaries. And then the daily news shows, you can see much smaller in terms of number, but as we've already mentioned, they really punch above their weight in terms of cut through. And I'll come back to that uh, in terms of the top end of the charts. Um, and then in terms of who's producing uh, what content, um, I think what you've got is you've got uh, print and digital born brands doing typically more unscripted talk and interview based shows. And I think this is partly because they're really, uh, it's quite easy to reuse the talents of the newsroom. Journalists are often great at, uh, at talking and it's something that can be done alongside other tasks without taking them too far away. I mean, the one on the left is a great example of that. Charles Curran, who's a a columnist for the Times basically creates a podcast or has been creating a podcast where he sits at his kitchen uh, table with his wife discussing what he's going to put in the, the newspaper column. And you would think this wouldn't be hugely successful, but it actually went to the top of the Apple charts for, for quite a while last year. So um, relatively cheap. Uh, Ezra Klein, you can see there um, from Vox, one of uh, 200 podcasts that Vox now produce. And they've doubled that number in the, in the last year. And a lot of them, again, are these sort of uh, chat podcasts. Whereas broadcasters really started doing, I mean, they are doing unscripted stuff as well, but proportionally more of their top shows tend to be sort of scripted documentaries. Again, reusing the skills and the knowledge they already have in-house, in if you like. Uh, so the one on the on, on the left there, Tunnel Twenty Nine, uh, was a was a hit last year. Uh, I highly recommend it. It's a fantastic podcast, and it actually went back on the radio, so it started as a podcast, and that's part of a series they're doing called Intrigue. Um, now, of course, a lot of this is shifting now, so you're getting broadcasters doing more unscripted, uh, like Corona Newscast and the BBC, and print increasingly moving into documentaries and radio. And the Times is a great example of that. They've just started um, daily news podcast and also a, a linear radio station. Um, so they're looking at this as a real opportunity and they're investing very, very hard. So, so I think we're seeing the starting positions mixing up a lot more. Independent pr production sector is really interesting and very different across countries. So we have a, a pretty strong one in Australia. Uh, so this is actually a broadcast network 10 that set up a podcast studio effectively to create content that was really native and podcast first and they created some really successful unscripted shows like the professor and the hack which is one of the sort of talk interview shows uh, very successful and then um, an example of an episodic true crime series where's william tyrrell which was a big hit last year and then in france again slightly different you have um, fast growing independent studios so relatively small number but this is an example from louis media and it was a show they did about sexual harassment in French journalism that was successful. In the US, this tends to be much bigger. So it's a much bigger part of the picture are these independent studios. You probably remember Gimlet bought by, by Spotify, but also Wondery, 
uh, which has is, is you know pr really specializing in these big blockbusters one they released last year dr death had huge ambition a lot of uh, finance involved in it uh, and it was the first podcast to be simultaneously released in in seven different languages so uh, i think you know the independent sector is bigger in some countries than in others and then um this is quite interesting it's this chart is really looking at the differences between countries in terms of the percentage of people listening to non-domestic podcasts. So that's what this chart shows. Pink is the proportion of podcasts listened to that were not produced in that country. So in the UK, Australia, and Sweden, you can see there's a lot of listening to essentially American uh, shows because there's not much of a, bar a language barrier there. Whereas in France, uh, you can see that it's almost exclusively French language content that's being listened to. There's very little cut through for English shows. And in the US, we see a similar picture, but it's a very different story. So that's really because there's so much high quality domestic content, it's really hard for anyone else to, to cut through. So we did find uh, shows from the BBC and the Financial Times and The Economist in the top 200, but not many others in, in the US. It's often the way in the US, it's hard for others to break into that incredibly competitive market. Interestingly, the, the daily is in the top 200 in all five of those countries. So now just to look at the, the, the daily news podcast sector, and here we're just looking at native podcasts, and I'm gonna exclude uh, in this section, Catch Up Radio. And across the five countries we looked at, we identified around 60 of these, um, so that the majority of them are daily news podcasts. They, they're launched in the last two years, uh, or you can see that curve really accelerating in the last two years uh, and more on the way. So in the last year, we had the journal, uh, the leader from the Evening Standard in the UK alone. Uh, I mentioned the Times just launched um, a few weeks ago, the Mail at the end of last year. Uh, so they're, they're happening all, all the time. And then we've got the spate at the moment of pop-up coronavirus dailies as well. And I'll come on to those a little bit later. Now, if we, if we sort of divide this category up a bit, um, we, get, we get some really interesting data. So um, what we're doing here is we're, we're looking at those 60, um, but we're dividing them up into different types of different length. And so the ones at the bottom, and you can see the small cluster, uh, in purple is what we're calling micro bulletins. So these tend to be more uh, news on demand, very short, one to five minutes. So things like uh, BBC Minute, NPR News Now. Uh, some of these are aimed at voice devices or maybe uh, some of the other platforms like um, Spotify Drive, um, but they're uh, also available as podcasts, which is why we have them in this category. Uh, Spotify started calling them snacks and they've just, uh, I think this week, uh, done a big promotion on this idea of short podcasts that you can listen to and creating playlists of them. So I think I see this as a category that's going to grow a little bit. In the middle, you have uh, mid-length mid news updates. So often they have uh, three or four items in them and the main aim is to update people very quickly on the news of the day. So they aim very much at that morning uh, slot. FT business briefing being a good example, up first uh, from NPR, very successful sort of 10 minute news podcast from National Public Radio in the US. And then you have at the top, you've got this sort of big wedge of deep dives where you're essentially looking at one subject in, in depth. I mean, some of them do a bit more than that, but that's basically what they're doing. So you have Code Source in, in France, uh, La Story from La Parisienne, uh, Beyond Today from the BBC, uh, Today in Focus. So, so these kind of, of shows, they tend to be, you know, somewhere between 20 and 30 minutes, uh, typically. Uh, if we look at um, what's most popular, I mean, all of these can be popular in different ways, but we certainly see in the UK and the US, it tends to be the deep dives that are most popular. So the New York Times say they're getting around 2 million people a day listening to the daily. Today in the Focus, from The Guardian has an audience now that is bigger than the print newspaper every day, uh, which is I mean, it's worth thinking about that. Uh, and it's done it in less than a year or you know, 18 months or so. Uh, and then in Australia, slightly different picture. So ABC is, is the signal aimed at younger audiences, but you've also got um, independent media doing really well there. And 
and leading the charge. I think a lot of the mainstream didn't get involved very early, though they are now. And then a slightly different picture in Sweden, where actually micro bulletins and news roundups are most popular um, with uh, ECOP from Swedish radio, which is a constantly updated thing. Omnipod also updated several times during the day, uh, which is an independent. And then actually the, the, the sort of the daily equivalent, which comes from Aftonblad, a little bit running behind. So uh, what about the practicalities? So how many people do you need? Um, how many people typically are creating these things? The daily news ones I, I'm thinking about particularly. So the New York Times says the daily now has around 15 dedicated staff uh, to produce that um, you know, five editions a week or so as part of a wider audio team now of 30 and they've been investing a lot more. You probably saw Kara Swisher joining and, and doing a new podcast um, so they're really, really upping their game in audio. Uh, Guardian, The Economist, around eight for, um, for each of their daily news podcasts. Some smaller shows that we talk to have around four to five. So typically, you know, the, the, the least you can get away with if you're doing the daily podcast uh, is somewhere around that, maybe three. Uh, if you're really stretching it, you need a host, an executive producer, uh, maybe a, a sound engineer, a sound designer, a really important part of, of this sort of narrative storytelling creating mood, uh, all of these kind of things. And just in terms of, of skills, so sometimes people come in from radio, and so they're bringing talent from, uh, who already have uh, broadcast experience. In other cases, like Michael Barbaro, you know, they were print reporters who just transferred and had this sort of natural uh, ability to relate to people in the audio medium. Can you make money? <laughs> so this is obviously a, 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 a critical question. Is it paying off? Uh, and, um, you know, we may have to revise this a little bit, but um, interestingly, talking to The Economist, um, so they launched one called The Intelligence about um, a year ago, a year and a half ago, and it has a weekly audience of about half a million, and people are listening to sort of two or three episodes each week, they, and they say they're already making money, so within the first few months it was making money, and uh, in the UK and US we certainly hear that you know, things have really changed. Blue chip advertisers were really piling in um, before the coronavirus. Um, and although, you know, advertising has been hit by the lockdown, we may, we may need to rethink um, the advertising side of things. I'll come back to that. Um, I think what we also found was outside the US and the UK, people were really struggling to make money from advertising. So in other words, you know, the, there is a, there's a lag and um, many smaller publishers that didn't have the reach or big publishers in small countries found that they weren't able to make enough money from the advertising currently to pay for the investments they needed in staff. So for some of them, it was a leap of faith. It was about saying over a few years, we're going to get there. Uh, in other cases, they're actually you know, actively looking for different kinds of business models. But I think what's interesting is that... Um, you know, for many of the people that we talked to, the main aim wasn't necessarily to make ad money. So even the, even the New York Times that was making really good money out of, out of it, uh, their main focus was how do you build loyalty and habits? And they saw audio and podcasts as a great way of doing this. So, you know, uh, here's uh, Eric Bernstein, who runs audio there saying, you know, we're just thrilled to have 25 minutes a day with people. It's a sense of, of time and commitment and that they're listening for two to three editions a, uh, a week, that they are listening uh, mostly to the end. And it's really showcasing the value that they're getting from uh, New York Times journalism to existing subscribers, but also as a way of attracting potential new subscribers. Uh, and that's really the second sort of motivation is, is to use podcasts to attract the next generation of, of subscribers. And I talked earlier about how difficult it is for younger, for publishers to get to that younger demographic. And this is really something that works. So uh, National Public Radio talking here about their audience for, for podcasts. If you take a show like Up First uh, is 20 years younger than on the radio. So it's equivalent. It goes out on the radio about 5 a.m. And then... Uh, through the podcast medium and they see a 20, 20 year difference in terms of the audiences. So this is really important for many uh, publishers. And then uh, I'm gonna come on to COVID-19 in a minute. I just wanted to mention a little bit about the other really interesting aspect of this right now, which is the changing nature of the platforms themselves and the, the growth, uh, which I think we're gonna see more of, of a, whole, a host of new 
intermediaries in the audio space. So for almost 20 years, uh, podcast really was associated with Apple and, and the iPod and the iPhones. And, you know, that's really starting to change. So this is um, data from uh, Libsyn, which is a hosting platform. And this is just US data, but it shows there. Apple is now down 57% um, of usage of podcasts that are played out through their network. Spotify market share is 13%. But in some parts of Europe, we find that Spotify has already overtaken Apple. Uh, we're going to have much more detail of that in the digital news report this year. Um, but I think this is, uh, this, is really, uh, this is a really significant shift. There are now two major players in the market. Uh, and Spotify certainly is investing a lot, lot in it. You also have Google uh, putting uh, podcasts in search results for the first time. And um, I think together, these platforms are really helping to take podcasts out of this sort of little elite latte drinking bubble into sort of mainstream audiences. Um, and that's definitely, you know, Spotify's stated aim is to take it to a different audience. Um, and, you know, also to help their own business model of increasing loyalty and stickiness. So they, they're investing uh, 500 million or so in podcasting, that's in content, buying studios um, and doing distribution uh, as well. Um, so just some examples of that, they signed up two very famous comedians in, in Germany for exclusive content. So the idea is that there are, you know, this idea of originals or exclusives in the same way as you have with Netflix to attract people to the platform specifically. Uh, and then you have other initiatives like Daily Drive, uh, which I mentioned before, which is kind of an automated playlist, which includes these sort of short snacks uh, and music. So the idea is you're kind of recreating the idea of a, of a sort of personalized radio station, which ultimately will work in cars uh, and all the rest of it. Uh, and then you've got other platforms as well, such as um, uh, pay platforms like uh, Luminary, uh, Podimo in Europe, um, there were some in France as well, small platforms that was trying to create a sort of a paid environment for podcasts as well. And I think in many ways, the, this epidemic may, uh, the coronavirus epidemic may move people um, a bit more towards looking at some of these possibilities of paid podcasts as well. And then finally, um, we should remember the broadcasters who are really worried about the platforms to some extent. They obviously want their content to be distributed but they also want to keep control of that experience and they want to have that direct connection with audiences on their own platforms and apps. So BBC Sounds is a really good example in the UK. Um, again, we're going to have more detail in the digital news report about how these platforms are doing uh, for podcasts compared with Apple and Spotify. Um, but certainly BBC Sounds is doing very well in the UK. And what's interesting is that they, you know, they, they are often, uh, putting their content first onto their own platforms and then releasing them elsewhere. So this idea of windowing as a way of getting people to come to your platform first is, is quite interesting. The BBC has also pulled its content from Google because it says Google is preferencing its own podcast service through search. So there's a whole load of these battles going on. Uh, I think that is being addressed. So that's basically where we were at the beginning of the year. Um, but obviously our world has, has sort of slightly turned upside down since then. Um, so how much of this is still true? How much of it is relevant? What has changed and, and, and what's likely to change? Uh, as I said, I've been talking to some of the people we talked to in December to see um, what's been happening to, to their traffic. So firstly, in terms of traffic, it is a little bit of a confusing picture. So some publishers are reporting drops, some are increases, and we're also seeing subtly different uh, patterns in different countries. Uh, if we look first at the US, so this chart is from PodTrack, I mentioned earlier, and a couple of things about this. So firstly, you can see that news podcasts, that's the red line, are the largest category in terms of year-on-year -year growth. Uh, and you can also see that the gap between the red line, the news and the other categories, uh, grew uh, at the beginning of March. So since the beginning of March, the gap is bigger. And uh, the beginning of March is obviously when um, the sort of public concern really started growing. I think the lockdowns in the US started on the 16th of March or somewhere around then. And you can see uh, that growth at that peak and then starting to fall off uh, a little bit since then. Also a spike in business uh, as people sort of start to worry about the economy, I guess. And then other categories like sport 
and um, uh, some lifestyle stuff is flat or, or negative. So, as I say, a bit, bit of a mixed uh, picture. And um, I also mentioned the sort of pop-up podcasts. There's been a lot of them in the US. And um, I think uh, Acast, who are a provider, talked about 100 or 200 different uh, pop-up uh, coronavirus podcasts that had emerged. Uh, if we look at the US specifically, two of the most successful, NPR launched um, five weeks ago, Coronavirus Daily. Uh, interesting that it's, it's 10 minutes. It's also aimed at the afternoon. So I think one of the one of the changes is obviously uh, the morning commute has has sort of disappeared uh, in many countries, and so people are thinking, well, what would be a time of day when people might have a bit of time? What would be the best kind of day? And some people are going for the afternoon. Um, they say it's the fastest ever growth of a launch of a podcast, and and it's still growing but leveling off a little bit now. Uh, they've also been experimenting with different kinds of podcasts around mindfulness and uh, curating. Um, other podcasts within Spotify and within their own NPR One environment as well. So I think that's an interesting development. Um, some of these experimentations, I think you get these, these major events like COVID-19 and it, it leads to people thinking differently. And I think that's a really good example of it. Uh, and then CNN was actually one of the earliest into this space. And again, I think it's really interesting to see, see the length there. Again, it's 10 minutes. So people don't have the longer commute anymore. One of the reasons that the, the length was 20 minutes or 30 minutes is because that's nearer to the, to the length of the average commute. And this is also an example of one where they're really trying to leverage specialism and medical expertise. So their um, the medical correspondent who's a medical doctor uh, interviewing other experts about it and there's a real sort of thirst and hunger for that so it's uh, it's right up in the top 20 of podtrack and we're seeing this elsewhere as well so this is um in from germany Das coronavirus podcast it's a huge hit um hosted by christian drosten and one of the leading experts in the world on coronavirus so he was one of those that um found sars and and um uh brought it to the attention of the world he's also advising chancellor merkel um, and he's developing his own tests at the Charity Hospital in Berlin. Now, you, you would think he wouldn't have time to do a podcast, but his, his motivation for doing it actually was to get better information out there. And he was sort of fed up with being misquoted or taken out of context within the constraints of uh, generalized media, such as television, as you can see there. And uh, his view is that podcasts are just this amazing medium to get the story out in depth and with real authenticity. Um, so the format that they've chosen, and this is working with uh, German public radio called uh, Northern German Radio NDR. So they, uh, science journalist interviews him and then there's questions from the audience. Um, and the format really allows him not just to say what he knows, but also to discuss in a nuanced way, some of the hypotheses as well about um, the balance of likelihood that this might be true or, or not, and to take questions in this sort of discursive manner. And here's Norbert Grundai, who's the program manager um, who you know, came up with the idea, saying that one of the real sort of benefits is that the podcast, you know, people, ordinary people are getting the same information as Chancellor Merkel uh, is getting. And I think that's that kind of idea has been a real, a real draw in that particular case. Uh, this is Sweden. Uh, so this is an aggregate chart from ACAST to act on behalf of a lot of publishers so, you, so they can really show the wider pattern. And you can see the chart there uh, shows, you have to remember that, that Sweden hasn't had a complete lockdown, but even so you can see the change to the listening habits. So the yellow line is before the lockdown period, so before week 12 in Swedish terms. And you see that, that big morning peak and then a little bit of an afternoon peak. And you can see how that's flattened off, essentially. The morning peak is, is broadly, the morning commute has broadly disappeared. And, um, uh, you, you, and you can also see here some other kinds of diversion. So what they're seeing is also an increase in shows about health and business and entertainment and food and drink. Um, though many of those um, uh, are popular because they're actually dealing with different aspects of the lockdown. So how to make, you know, for example, how to make cheap and nutritious meals from a few, uh, few ingredients, how to keep your kids occupied at home. I mean, these are some of the things that are not necessarily dealt with in traditional news podcasts, but other podcasts 
they're already going have been pivoting their content towards it and uh, is ACAR sort of talking about the creativity that is really going on on the on the content side. Swedish Radio is the biggest podcast producer in Sweden. Uh, for them, overall listening, on-demand listening is down. So um, people are at home and you know that, that sort of they're not necessarily in the gym or on their commute. So the overall on-demand bit is down. But some news provision is up. Um, so I mentioned ECOT earlier, so up 50%. So much more interest, obviously, in what's going on in coronavirus and more access of those. They also mentioned that uh, their clips, which is very short uh, on-demand audio updates within their app, was up 75% uh, and from their website. So, um, you know, essentially, the, again, it's just showing the same picture that news is up, other, other genres uh, are a bit down. UK, everyone is doing pop-up podcasts. Uh, this is just literally a sample of what's available. Um, again, interesting that um, a lot of these are 10 minutes, Telegraph One, for example, 10 minutes. I think it's the first time they've done a daily news podcast. Uh, some are, are longer and much more discursive, like the BBC's Coronavirus podcast, which was very interesting. It's kind of came out of originally an experiment around Brexit. Uh, and it was called Brexit Cast, and it was kind of an example of a different tone correspondents being allowed to let their hair down and be more authentic and take questions from audience and all of that kind of thing. And they've carried that through to last year's election when it was called election cast and now it's become Corona, Corona cast, uh, coronavirus newscast. So I think, you know, some, some experimentation that happened before is being some of the learning from that is, 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 is going and being taken on through. Um, in other cases, rather than having the pop up, people are just reusing the same uh, the same brands. So the Guardian have this very successful podcast called Today in Focus, and essentially it's become a coronavirus podcast, as you can see here from some of the episodes. Um, uh, and they have changed some, you know, a few things around. So sometimes they do just a single edition, just one subject. Normally it's two, uh, but they've tried to incorporate the same ideas of character and casting and human stories and really sort of bring those out. So there was one I listened to last week at this one about surviving ICU. So uh, somebody who'd been through coronavirus and been in hospital and uh, almost died, thought he was going to die. It was an amazingly powerful uh, human story told in, in 25 minutes. Um, so that, so, you know, this is the kind of thing that, podcasts can do that makes them different from you know, traditional traditional radio. Uh, Financial Times broadly um, same approach so so dealing uh, sticking with existing um, brands like the news briefing that I mentioned earlier but tweaking the content for the new normal. So uh, news briefing uh, I guess lost some of its purpose and its audience because the whole idea of it is you know give me 10 minutes and I will uh, give you everything you need to know. Um, at the beginning of the day as part of your commute or your morning routine. Uh, but now people have different morning routines. They're kind of changing it and doing a bit more analysis and maybe some slightly longer items. And they also recognize that it's being listened to throughout the day. So this makes it more difficult because you're not, you're not producing something where you know the state of mind people are in. Um, uh, just as an aside, they also did some audience research during the period of the coronavirus and people talked about the change of routine that they didn't have a commute anymore and that they found it difficult to find time for podcasts i know my per my personally my podcast podcast listening has gone down because you're you're not really alone in the same way um and so that takes away and most people are list, have been listening to podcasts alone rather than rather than together on the other hand i think that it's maybe sparked some different ways of of thinking about podcasts and different times of day. So maybe afterwards this will be beneficial and we'll, we'll have some new routines as well. Uh, and then they also, a very interesting experiment they were doing around paid podcasting uh, with this one called the Rackman Review, uh, which was actually behind the paywall. They took it out behind the pay from the paywall, audiences doubled, it's really grown. And then they've, uh, this is, he talks to, you know, fantastic, got a great contacts book, in this case, Greg Harlan Brundtland, Francis Fukuyama, talking about the big ideas, the bigger picture, uh, and that's done really well for them. 
Uh, Denmark has used this as an opportunity. It's been planning to do a daily news podcast. It launched in the middle of this and very strong early figures. Again, it's really, it's called Restart. It's, it's focusing on coronavirus. It's, it's had a, a very, very successful launch. And Politiken, which is one of the most popular um, quality publishers in, in Denmark, has opened up its uh, paywall. So it, it had a strategy where the podcast was for a number of days a week behind the paywall. So it put it open, which obviously increased the audience a lot. Uh, but they've also shortened the length. Again, going back to this idea that uh, people don't have the same amount of time, they're listening in a different context, and they've increased the coronavirus um, focus. And then finally, Australia. Um, so GFK, who, who run the radio and audio um, uh, measurements across uh, publishers say that one in 10 are listening to more podcasts. So here's one where a country where apparently people are listening to more. Um, and ABC, again, similar to other countries where the news podcasts are doing very well, some other ones doing less well or have been pivoting. And they were talking here about often um, taking existing brands, so in this case, something called Mindfully, and rebranding it as Corona Calm and uh, giving people these sort of five minute meditative um, exercises or different ways of thinking about the world that are appropriate for the lockdown. So I think a huge amount of sort of creativity and thinking that's gone on um, uh, during this crisis. So what does all this add up to? Um, I think in terms of the impact, I think it's a, it's a mixed result in terms of Audiences. Some genres like news are doing better. Others uh, have definitely, like sport, for example, because no live sport, are, are, are broadly doing worse. Um, the patterns of listening have changed, so there's less of a morning commuting peak. Uh, obviously, that will probably come back, but maybe not to the same extent for some time, uh, which makes it harder to, to target for one use case. Uh, I think there's a really interesting one here about quality and what that means uh, so i think you know beforehand particularly if you were a radio producer doing podcasts you would really care about the quality of the audio and all the training and manuals would say this and a lot of that has gone out the window and audiences seem to 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 love it so you know this idea of authenticity may be trumping perfection and that may be make being a bit of a breakthrough for for uh, radio producers who are trying to basically almost overproduce some of these things. So I think that may be uh, a legacy that continues. I think some of the big series have been postponed. So the, these really depend, they're very expensive. They depend on advertising or underwriting. And um, that's clearly going to be effective for some time. So actually getting the finance together to do these big blockbusters is probably the thing that's going to be most affected. Whereas the sort of talk interview shows and the news related stuff is going to be easier to keep going. And then I think, um, yeah, there's just the general, we know that, that we're going to have this general economic downturn means that I think we'll see a shakeup. I think we'll see some less performing podcasts be discontinued earlier than they otherwise would be. And then acceleration of new models, um, experimentation, pop-up formats, these kind of things we'll probably see a bit more of. And finally, you know, just a little bit more, more widely, um, from everything, you know, what, what persists, I think is, uh, I think we can be pretty sure now, not just around this, but before it, news and politics is a major driver of usage. This whole idea of daily news podcasts, which wasn't even around a few years ago, is a major part of the picture now, and with significant opportunities. Stout the R, um, I think that will come back. I think the long-term benefits of, of time and listening is going to be important. And um, this benefit of loyalty and habit and attracting young people is incredibly important. And then I think the platforms uh, is very significant. So podcasts have been around for a long time. It's been really hard to get beyond this sort of tag. Well, um, it's 
you know, I think we've uh, lost uh, Nick for a bit. Um, maybe there's some problem with the, with the other. We're going to uh, try to sort that out in the next couple of uh, minutes. Um, yeah, in the meantime, I, I mean, um, I'm sure that you have uh, been enjoying what he said about the podcasting. I remind you uh, that uh, most of the things that uh, that uh, Nick uh, said today, especially the first part, I uh, included in the report that we published in December uh, last year. Uh, it is a report that you can find uh, on the chat function. I, I left the, uh, the link uh, a few minutes ago. And, um, and yeah, I mean, it's obviously important to, to remember uh, that some of the things that are in the report, I think we are uh, going to be with uh, Nick very soon, uh, have been changed in the last couple of uh, months uh, with the lockdowns and all that and, and the change in, in daily routines of many, many people. Nick, are you with us now? Yeah, sorry about that. I'm not sure yeah, what no happened. No problem. I think you were uh, actually in the last slide uh, um, telling us uh, a little bit about the impact of COVID on this, but uh, we can go to questions unless you want to add anything. No, it's fine. Okay. Okay. Yeah, sorry about that. Great, no problem. It's been just a minute and uh, it's, there's always something <laughs> coming up. Uh, great, so, um, well, the first question that we have is from Tom Westgard and uh, it's a very interesting question. He asks, is it possible to include YouTube uh, in the podcast section, in the sense that you know shows uh, like the one uh, by Joe Rogan or others sure. get millions of views uh, on that platform too. Yeah, I mean, and and it's uh, that's a really good question, and it's definitely happening. Um, not, I mean, particularly in the states. So you have Joe Rogan, but you also have a lot of um, shows that are now video shows, uh, like uh, Rachel Maddow, Maddow and MSNBC. Same thing; they do sort of cut downs of the video. And then they put them out um, as both video and they work as video and audio. So this is a growing trend. And in some countries like uh, Korea, we're also seeing a lot of YouTube. So YouTube generally growing for lots of things. So I think we're seeing a hybrid between, uh, you, you see a lot of people with sort of audio setups in the States that you with their big microphones. They've been doing this for years and putting them out. And also in countries like Turkey, you get, um, shows that are put out basically um, from alternative politics shows that basically run as live shows, maybe for an hour and a half on, uh, on Periscope, YouTube, uh, and then they're available as podcasts as well. So, yeah. Great. Another question from Monica Elena. Um, she asks uh, about uh, the money, basically. So advertisers, advertisers sorry, are likely to stick to giants like The Daily or, or the like. Uh, where or how do you think independent producers can look to raise funds, especially among, amid the shrinking resources of this of this crisis? Are there alternative business models uh, that are proving to be successful apart from advertising? I guess. Yeah, so I think advertising isn't just for the big ones. I think you know, I think like like you see elsewhere, you're going to have big publishers who are going to attract big um, big advertising dollars. So if you've got reach, definitely. But advertisers, and I talked to a few for the research, are also interested in niches. Uh, so if you can show that you've got a really engaged audience in a particular area that is valuable to audiences, that's also going to really work, I think. Beyond that, um, as I mentioned, I think we're going to see more um, paid opportunities as well. So, um, and that will be, um, it's kind of profit share. So you're, you, you go in with uh, a pay provider like Podimo or Luminary and you get a share of the listening of their subscription revenue as part of, as part of the listening. Uh, some of that I think is going to be tricky, but it, 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 it may work over time. And then you've also got platforms starting to pay for content for exclusive content in the same way as you have in other areas. So Spotify, for example, doing deals. Uh, yeah, for, I was, I, I was going to ask that. Uh, do you think we are going to see exclusive content just for Spotify, as we are seeing in, let's say, Netflix or other video platforms? Uh, yes. Well, we we already are. I mean, they're already commissioning and spending a lot of money on on these originals. Um, you know, I think I mentioned one. Um, maybe I didn't mention it, but the the story of the Clash, which I really enjoyed, I don't think is available anywhere else. Mm. Um, and it was a co-production with BBC Studios. So BBC, you know, all the archive that BBC had. 
they put together a fantastic sort of six-part series which you listen to but what it was great for Spotify because it also encouraged people to listen to more music because you had sort of playlists associated with it so they're very heavy into things like music documentaries and as far as I'm aware that was completely exclusive I think in other cases they will pay for first use mm. and then later you can then release it into other platforms so you get the kind of best of both worlds so I think we're going to see more of that as well. Mm. Uh, well, our friend uh, Steiner Larsen uh, has seen all the figures about Sweden and he's asking about Norway. I don't know if you have any data or some insights about the Norwegian market in podcasting. Uh, not really. I mean, the, we, for, the, for the research that we did, we did it. We just really focused on um, five different countries that we felt were interesting. And I guess uh, Norway is relatively similar to Sweden um, uh, in terms of a very strong public broadcaster like NIK doing um really interesting and, and you know versioning a lot of stuff uh, but i don't have specific information about the one uh, a question from our friend uh, corinne podger uh, she's asking uh, particularly about uh, how to monetize podcasts uh, for children if there is any experience or any podcast uh, for children that you are aware about ah that's a, that's a really good question i don't know a lot of, i mean one thing i would say is you know uh, again we saw this in the in the slides i think you know one of the real hits in in the coronavirus thing has been the success of a lot of children's podcasts uh, or on demand content in general uh, you know curriculum content um, but also you know just content to entertain kids has been really popular so um, Uh, ABC in Australia talked to me about that. BBC's obviously had some some big hits in that, and a lot of that is public service content, essentially. I mean, it, this is true generally. A lot of um, children's content, it's much harder to make money out of that because it's much harder to advertise directly to children. Mm -hmm. So um, that's why traditionally public broadcasters have played very strongly in in, in that space. Mm -hmm. Um, we have a question from Logan Nicola, um, and he, I mean, he's asking about something that you covered a bit uh, during the presentation. Any examples of programs who pivoted from a pre-existing topic to covering only COVID? That's what we did at the uh, AFP, uh, he says, uh, with mm -hmm. our US Politics Weekly uh, 2020. Uh, he's curious to know if others went through similar changes. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I think that's definitely the case with most of the um, daily news podcasts, and they've essentially become coronavirus podcasts, even if they haven't rebranded themselves that way. And I showed you the, the the Guardian's example, where I think on that list, everything was about coronavirus. Um, but I think the benefits of that, uh, that is the benefit of having that daily news podcast thing, is you can just sort of switch it and, um, you know, you can really, uh, whereas when you, if you tie yourself into a coronavirus podcast and you find that suddenly attention is dipping um, or you do, I mean, a lot of people are doing US election. Well, that's, you know, that's going to run for a while um, and you're going to really reach a, a niche of people who are very, very super interested in it. But you're also going to want to do that within your daily news podcast. So you have to decide where you're going to focus, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, question about the attention dipping too. I mean, do you foresee some kind of news fatigue um, about this topic at some point? Because this is going to stay with us for, you know, months, potentially a year or two. Do you think there's some point where, you know, we are fed up or some part of the audience fed up with this? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think that's true already. I mean, as you know, Eduardo, we published some research around this in the last few days. And um, if you look at most of the audience data, we saw that huge surge in interest. And then it sort of come back to a new normal, which is in some cases a bit above. Um, and people talk about, you know, it's, it's not like, well, we're avoiding news. It's like, we just have, we don't want, need it all the time. You know, we, we've come to our own sense of how much new we need to find out each day. And we've got our own ways of doing it. And we're, we're not going to devote as much time as we did during that peak. So I think that's kind of where we are. I think within that, there are going to be lots of new opportunities to continue to engage people and think creatively about how to keep people engaged as the story moves on to different phases. And that's why I think some of these ongoing formats like um, like a news daily news podcast is, is, is a good thing to have because you can just sort of adjust and really listen to your audience about what, what might they might be interested in. Right. 
a question from Laban Onserio uh, from Kenya. Um, he says that they have seen a, a rise in podcasting in Kenya, and he's asking specifically about the duration of the podcast um, to maximize engagement. Is there any is there any rule of thumb in, on, on this, depending on the topic, maybe or the format? Sure. Hi, Laban. Good, 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 good to see you. Thanks for the question. Um, I think uh, it's, it, it depends on the kind of podcast you're talking about. So I mentioned some of the lengths earlier. So typically people, when there was no lockdowns going on, people were looking at the commute and, you know, you know what the average commute is. It's slightly longer in the US, which is why some of their podcasts are nearer to 30 minutes. And it's a bit shorter in Europe, which is why they're nearer to 20 minutes. So a lot of publishers are thinking that way. Uh, it's a good length of time to tell a story if you're doing a daily news podcast. But in other cases, if you're basically looking to fill a different purpose in people's lives, like a daily meditation, it might be five minutes. You know, So I think you have to think about what you're trying to do and what the audience need is that you're trying to, uh, to fill at any particular moment in time. And the other thing I would say just about um, uh, Africa and Kenya is... Um, that again, in, in some parts of the world, you, you have a real problem with the business model. So there is virtually no business model in Kenya for, uh, for podcasts. So it is growing and people are interested in them, but that's one of the things that's holding podcasts back in Africa. The other thing that's holding podcasts back is, is bandwidth, which is less of a problem in Kenya than it is in South Africa, for example, but um, it means it's very, very hard. You know, the moment for podcasts is not right here for, in South Africa, and it's not right here in Kenya either because, uh, because not all the conditions are quite there yet, like the advertising and the bandwidth. Staying in Africa, we have a question from Kate Barlett, and she's asking precisely about South Africa, and uh, and she's saying that well, basically that the latter drinking audience that you were talking about before are mostly listening to U.S. podcasts, and and she's asking yeah. if you see there is a space for for some kind of domestic uh, uh, podcast, you know, listening there. Yeah, no, I, I, I think there definitely is. There's definitely a gap and an opportunity, and I think it will grow. It's really a question of timing. I think um, from memory, I think weren't News24 doing something in South Africa or starting something in South Africa, and they were definitely thinking about it. Um, and I imagine some of the other publishers are too. But the real problem is bandwidth. So apart from the, you know, the people in offices who've got lots of bandwidth and people who are working for international companies, they've got access to that. But outside, it's really hard to... Um, to distribute the stuff because of the cost of bandwidth uh, in South Africa specifically. In other parts of Africa, that's less of a problem. Mm. Isabel Bannerman is asking about the public service broadcasters and the kind of differences between the podcast that they produce and the podcast produced by anyone else. Is there a pattern there? Um, I think that's just more difficult for them because essentially they're competing with themselves. <laughs> so, you know, it, essentially you're creating a, a product that is going to take away attention from your flagship programs at the same time of day. So I think that's difficult internally. And so what many of them did was they basically said, well, we're not going to do that. We're going to basically go for young audiences and create something for young audiences. Mm -hmm. But young audiences don't necessarily want a news podcast for young audiences. So I think some of those have not been that successful. Whereas the Danish one, um, yeah, but I think m many of them have got to this tipping point now. So things like seeing the success of Today and Focus in the UK or uh, the Daily in the US has made the broadcasters think, right, we really need to do something uh, more mainstream and just hit the problem head on. Otherwise, you know, our audience is going to be eaten by, by, by new competitors. Mm -hmm. A final question from Logan Nicola, very specific, but I don't know if you have figures on this. Any significant drive in news podcast adoption in the US that could be attributed to Google Assistant uh, uh, news playlist that they launched last fall? I don't know. <laughs> this is super specific, Nick, but I don't know if you have any, um, any sense on it. Yeah. Um, so I think it's probably, I, 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 I don't know. I mean, I think essentially what we're talking about here is Google's sort of audio um, service where they teamed up with various publishers and those publishers, and you can now ask your Google Assistant for specific news about coronavirus. In fact, we're seeing um, Apple have introduced a similar service with Siri as well. So you can now ask Siri specifically about coronavirus. And I think this is definitely a growth area. What we found when we did the work on voice assistants was that audiences, don't really 
you know, not many people really want to do that. They are overwhelmed with breaking news alerts on their mobile phone. They just don't really need another <laughs> another thing. So this, to me, feels like a, a a bit of a barrier is that that's not really taken off yet. That combination of product features, ease of use, um, over another platform means that a lot of those sort of immediate platform driven, ask me a question, give me an answer in audio hasn't really taken off yet. Uh, but I don't have any evidence for what, exactly what's happened since they launched it in the US. My, my, my hunch is it's not, not doing brilliantly yet. Well, thank you so much, uh, Nick. I think it's been a real pleasure to listen to you as uh, we have a bit of a problem at the end, but as Joe Sheldon said in the chat, authenticity trumps quality, as, 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 uh, as Nick yes. said before. Uh, so this is case in point. Uh, well, three final things for everyone. First, uh, thank you, everyone. I know how busy you are, how difficult these times years and, uh, these are for you, and, and we really appreciate that you, you make the time for this, for this uh, webinar. Second, um, I will uh, send you an email um, in the next few hours with, with, with the video of the event and also with the slides that, uh, that Nick has just shared with us. So you can, you know, re-watch the video or check the slides, whatever you need. Uh, and finally, as I always say, please wash your hands and, you know, stay in place if your government says so. Uh, this, this is a really, really tough uh, time for everyone, also for journalists. And if you have to report outside, please uh, follow the, the basic hygiene rules. Uh, thank you again for, for coming, for staying with us. We will have events next week. Uh, on Wednesday and Thursday. We will announce them in our social channels. And yes, um, we will see each other next week. Thanks a lot. Bye.